What's up, Previews World? Welcome to our Marvel discussion with Patrick McDonald and Alex Ross, courtesy of Marvel Arts. Uh, what is Marvel Arts exactly? Well, back in 2021, Marvel Comics and Abrams Books announced Marvel Arts, a new line of graphic novels overseen by Charles Kaufman, who was the uh, who is the editorial director of Abrams Comics Arts, and Tom Brevoort, Marvel's VP of Publishing. It's uh, more of a curated experience for Marvel fans, one done in conjunction with Abrams, a company known for its high quality prestige releases. Uh, the first book from Marvel Arts was Fantastic Four Full Circle by Alex Ross, which skyrocketed to sales charts and racked up a lot of critical acclaim and industry award nominations this past year, proving that this Marvel Arts thing probably was a good idea. Uh, so what is next for Marvel Arts? Well, that is what we are here to discuss with, drum roll please, Alex Ross, creator behind the Fantastic Four Full Circle and Marvel Comics poster books. Hey, Alex. Hello, how are you? Doing all right, doing okay. And Mr. Patrick McDonald, creator behind the superhero's journey. How are you, Patrick? Oh, he's, he's elusive right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you're both like in a choppy stage. I don't know. Yeah. Motion, but, uh, you know. Johnny, our. our yeah, Patrick uh, is saying he has no audio at the moment. Oh, uh, okay. Hold on. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's uh, sort out Patrick real quick. But, Patrick, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Nope. No, I can't hear like it. Okay. Okay. He's not as choppy anymore. We were doing so great too. <laughs> it's the beauty of live stream. We're gonna be play everybody uh watching at home, please be patient with us for a second while we get this straightened out. Are people able to write things right now to Yeah, they're able to comment. Uh we have a separate chat where they can just kind of jump in and say things. I just want them to write the meanest things they can possibly. <laughs> oh, please don't say that. <laughs> what else comic... is the internet for except that? right, right? Especially comic book nerds. Are you kidding me? We should we should really do that. That's a great idea. <laughs> All right. So I don't know. Um, well, how, how about this? I'm gonna do my rest of my intro for those of you unfamiliar with their work. Patrick, can uh, you hear anything? Yeah. Hear anything. <laughs> oh no. Uh, let me see uh, if he can. If he's able to come out and like come back in, okay. There you go. Turn it off and turn it on again, Patrick. <laughs> this is exciting TV. This is, this is right. Yeah, this is uh, you know, fortunately, I think like uh, YouTube has kind of create uh, created a precedent that like, yeah, these uh these type of events are going to go wrong <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> Uh, well, look, for those of you unfamiliar with their work, uh, you're ridiculous. Uh, we're not going to bother with introductions. Uh, both of these creators have been recognized endlessly for their achievements in this medium. Uh, so when we get Patrick sorted out here, we're going to talk about first. But you know what, Alex? Uh, well, while we're sort talk about Patrick's book. I've got it right here. Yeah, we can just talk. Well, actually, I wanted Patrick to talk about Patrick's book. But actually, if you can just yeah, yeah throw you it up see, on the screen. The difference is I read it and I can say good things, whereas he shouldn't <laughs> say them about himself. You know what I mean? Also true. Can you say so, some good things about Patrick's book? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I can say very specific things about the one I'm holding here, which is that uh, whereas the average copy you're going to get is going to have a blank page right up next to the title page, okay. mine's not blank because I got a special drawing Patrick oh, did for me. Oh, nice. Let me get that straight. If anybody recognizes that, Patrick imitated my uh, Kingdom Come poster with the Marvel characters for me. So uh, that's <laughs> even my name up there, see? There you go. So, so there you go. That's uh, one of the many good things with this She's very super good Alex. So <laughs> <laughs> that only you can that only you have access to. I only have that one. Yes. Right, yeah, right. That's only for me. But my name is on the back of the book. So I, I've got okay. some inherent involvement here. So, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, this this is a very unique product that deserves everybody's attention, um, mm -hmm. just in terms of like the exposure of a point of view from the experience of a young reader absorbing mm -hmm. this stuff and then elaborating further to how the very nature of what these concepts and ideas do to reach out and mm -hmm. affect us. And um, I don't know, it's 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 hard to probably encapsulate it in many ways. The mixture between the classic art and Patrick's art leads to an epiphany 
uh, and epiphanies are very hard to relate storytelling wise, but he does it beautifully yeah. and it's worth the journey. Yeah, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Do we have actually, do we have audio on Patrick now? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Sorry. Hey. <laughs> So once again, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Ross, Patrick McDonald, round of applause. <laughs> and hello, Patrick. Alex, this is the first time we're actually meeting. Yes. Uh, I have to tell you, you know, my book is about the awe and wonder I experienced as a 10-year-old reading those Jack Kirby books. But uh, I re-experienced that awe and wonder when you came out with uh, your work, which is just amazing, you know. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you. It gave me that same feeling of like, wow, this is something. Oh, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Uh, we've heard a lot. Of, we've heard. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say that about Alex's work, myself included. So much appreciated. Actually, I'm glad you brought up seeing Jack Kirby's work for the first time, Patrick. Because my first question is, what is your? And this is directed to both of you. Your personal origin story with Marvel. When did you discover the House of Ideas? When did it latch on to you? Well, well for, for Patrick. You know, he started first because he hit it like a good decade before I did. Yeah, I was really lucky. Even though I'm an old, older guy, I was able to uh, experience Jack and Stan's work when it was first coming out. Uh, my first book that I personally bought was X-Men number 11. Uh, okay. I, I had an older brother who uh, told me and my younger brother what we were allowed to collect. And he allowed me the X-Men, which I was happy for because I loved the early X-Men. And, um, but we were there for all those, you know, when Galactus happened, we were going there once a month to see what was going to happen to that uh, story. And, you know, you know, Alex, again, uh, the book you did full circle for comic arts. I mean, that was such a moving book for me because you know, I was probably like 11 years old when th this man, this monster came out. Mm. And I feel like that was my first introduction to literature. I remember as a little kid just being blown away how powerful that story was. So, uh, boy, all these years later to read uh, your version of what happened next was uh, really exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's kind of a trope now where we see people do sequels to work that you think are sacred that you shouldn't really touch again. And I figured, eh, why not? That's where fate is taking me. I'm just going to go along with it. And even if it's the most audacious thing in the world, to give an answer for there's more to the story, uh, why not me? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, Alex, what about you? Uh, what is your Marvel origin story? When did you discover the Marvel universe? Well, like much like Patrick, you're getting your comic stuff from uh, grocery stores, or in his case, he illustrates this at the beginning of uh, his book here, the um, going to the local drugstore, which was mm -hmm. common in in the country where that's where you would reliably see new comics coming out on the rack inside of a store as opposed to a newsstand which of course we know those are long since gone mm -hmm. um i had similar kind of experience uh mostly a grocery store experience of seeing comics there and it wasn't until the 1980s when i was made aware of there being a local comic store in the town i grew up in lubbock texas that um i made the switch and never went back but <laughs> the first 10 years of my life would be from seeing the stuff in the co in the um the average stores that we all go to okay awesome awesome um how did you both get involved unlike you know like of course your your two projects are separate but they're both under the marvel arts banner um how did you both get involved with marvel arts like how did that meeting of the minds happen in the first place well i mean you you named them right at the start as uh, Charlie Cockman, mm -hmm. which I, I wish that was his name, but uh, it's Cochman. Oh, Cochman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> but he's he's been a good friend of both of ours, and uh, it just happens to be that um, it's the weird thing of Abrams having a license with Marvel already for a number of books they've been working on. Um, mm -hmm. A peak of those various books they've got was the one on these Marvel stamps, which just mm. came out, uh, mm -hmm. was that earlier this year? Just uh, just a week ago. The Marvel stamps? Yeah, well, at least I, maybe for, for, for Diamond, it came out just a week ago. It might've been already at a bookstores already. Oh, I, I think it's been out for a while, but um, anyways. Um, mm. So that book, I have a small part of, I did a cover for it, but otherwise, um, Charlie been working on that. And the fact that there was already this relationship there, when I was pitching to Marvel itself about doing 
a graphic novel line starting with the book you've got now mm -hmm. uh, that needed a home and marvel wasn't really willing to jump into doing the kind of graphic novel line like they did back in the 80s where mm -hmm. that was a long running line that ran up through the 90s and mm -hmm. uh, you know eventually petered out but um they they shot me down there but then there was this other outlet we were able to save the line and the project by going with this other relationship to develop graphic novels there which has been extremely well supported within the company so mm -hmm. marvel's been a strong partner in us pulling together other people and talents and uh that's where you know patrick is the perfect person to get from media that he's been involved in the arts and involved in comics but not strictly this form and so to get him is a huge get mm -hmm. absolutely what about you patrick uh, how did you come into the marvel arts banner you know that was uh, charlie kochman again um i know this is going to sound crazy but i had just finished doing a book with the dalai lama and <laughs> called heart to heart and um I was trying to figure out what do you do after that. <laughs> Charlie asked me if I would like to do a book with the Marvel superheroes, and man, that did, took me one second to say yes to that, and that's a boyhood dream come true. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I sure knew I was going to have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, Al Alex has been a great hype man for your book right now, right? <laughs> but in your own words, the superhero's journey, like I truthfully, the title alone, I'm a Joseph Campbell mark. So it has, it sounds like it has shades of Joseph Campbell in there. Is this an examination of some sort? Uh, well, you know, it's definitely has Joseph Campbell in there. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a spiritual journey for Mr. Fantastic with the Watcher. And I've always loved the Watcher character. And, and I feel like, um, you know, the book starts with a really powerful quote from Jack Kirby and ends with a powerful quote from Jack Kirby. But the opening quote is uh, Jack was asked in an interview, uh, what if you could have a superpower, what would you like it to be? And he immediately answered love. And uh, that's what this book is about. It's about Mr. Fantastic. You know, the, the comic plot is Dr. Doom to, to gets the negative zone to get, you know, it, uh, come into our country. And so everyone's negative. And Mr. Fantastic's trying to find out a way to make people positive. So he and the watch go on an inner journey to find uh, love, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, if I could add a point to this, that it's our works were lightly concurrent in that what Patrick was developing was independent of what I was doing, where mm -hmm. I had a whole theme regarding the negative zone, because that's where I take our mm -hmm. characters in, in full circle. And the idea that the negative zone is more than just an abstract uh, other dimension, but in fact that the very term negative has a value to it that may be defining and applying the entire place that it is. And the term I selected for Reed to give it is cycle reactive, mm -hmm. that it is itself an embodiment of negativity. And that's what mm -hmm. Patrick brings within his work without voicing it exactly the same. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely uh, I'm looking forward to the feel good aspect of this book when I when I uh, pick it up from my local comic shop. Um, you know, Alex, uh, let's jump over to Full Circle since you mentioned it. Uh, started as a pitch for the FF's return after a hiatus, right? That is exactly right. Yeah. After yeah. they had uh, stopped publishing it for a number of years because they were trying to force um, uh, Fox <laughs> to yeah. uh, give the property back. And uh, and then they eventually figured out, hey, if we could just buy Fox, then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's over with. <laughs> so it's a that's a gargantuan uh, strategy right there. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's wild, yeah. Um, so this is also to both of you. Uh, looking specifically at Superhero's Journey in Full Circle, what were the difficulties of putting both projects together? Because these are these both come off as painstakingly detailed, expansive concepts, right? So what were the the difficulties here? Patrick. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, we're here to promote you, man. <laughs> um, the difficulties. Well, you know, I combined my art with the classic pages of Lee Kirby and Ditko, and Don Heck. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, arranging that was, um, you know, just going through all. I, actually, I shouldn't say difficult. It was fun. I had to go pretty much reread all the books. 
I knew as a kid and we're picking panels that would work for the story and also looking for panels that would inspire me to maybe where the story would go. Um, you know, the only difficulty I had, my original idea was I was going to have Mr. Fantastic go to the commercial zone, which was going to be all the old ads, the um, original 1960s comics. I, I really wanted Mr. Fantastic to meet the sea monkeys. I don't know if you remember <laughs> the sea monkeys, but that was a... Uh, you know, one of the ads in the books, mm -hmm. but legally we just we just couldn't get there. And uh, without giving too much away, he ends up visiting the Love Comic. Yeah, Grit, <laughs> Grit was the Grit newspaper was the only uh, company that was legally okay with doing it. <laughs> it was just a surprise that even Grit newspapers still exist. Actually, all the all the comic ads that I was trying to get, they uh, they still exist. They still exist. You could still buy sea monkeys if you want. I was gonna say, like <laughs> someone someone owns that still owns that sea monkeys ad and still sitting on it. Huh? That's crazy. X ray specs, it uh, they haven't gone away. <laughs> That's funny. That's hilarious. Uh, what about you, Alex? Uh, what were the difficulties of putting together Full Circle, or even the poster book for that matter? But I guess the poster book is more of a collection of your previous stuff. Oh, the uh, oh, all the posters of all the Marvel characters that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that was part of a whole. Uh, a mural that I was creating essentially mm. for Marvel's offices in mm. 2020 when the world stopped. So yeah. they had just installed this giant life-size mural and nobody was there to ever see it or work around it. I haven't <laughs> uh, been over to Marvel since yet. Uh, I've never even seen a good photo of their offices to know how it looks it juxtaposed with people standing oh. in front of it. But it was designed to be something that people could get shots of themselves next to these characters life size. And so right. since I did all the heroes the first time round, after a year or so when they said, can you do more? Could you do the villains as well? And so now we've got a poster book of the villains published by Abrams too. Awesome. Awesome. Um, actually, I was going to ask you, I was actually going to ask you more about the poster book. Cause I was curious. Uh, yeah. What is, how long is that process? You weren't, you weren't physically there painting, the wall, like this is something that they printed on the wall, right? <laughs> no, the, the actual uh, paintings themselves are not that large. I mean, they don't mm -hmm. need to be because everything can just be scanned and then up, blown up, upsized yeah. whatever way you need it. So mm -hmm. uh, going back 25 years ago, when I first started on stuff like this for DC, I was doing first a, uh, what was intended for a super man. Uh, oh, you're getting a little choppy there, Alex. Uh, I guess it's your turn to be choppy. It was I heard the entire time or no? I heard super and man. <laughs> <laughs> that was about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, my, my story's great, so you're, you're going to want to hear me say it all over again. Uh, anyways, uh, I started off doing this kind of stuff for DC with posters mm -hmm. for them. And at first was a standee I was creating of Superman. So mm -hmm. okay. that painting I did was only at around 28, 29 inches high. And mm -hmm. so all the posters I've done for Marvel now are proportional to that. So mm -hmm. uh, I've got a whole host of these that I did. For, I've got the same for Marvel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Patrick, what do you hope readers get out of Superhero's Journey? We talked about the positivity overall, but what do you hope a reader gets out of it, new or old? Well, you know, I, I think all comic, you know, it's really my love letter to Marvel and Jack Kirby and Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Uh, I think all comic readers will relate to that joy and uh, that we get from reading these books and the inspiration we get from reading these books. Um, and just how it, it really becomes personal, you know, it, it, they stay with you. And uh, mm -hmm. the book is a love letter to that. And then on the spiritual side, it really is, you know, there's you know, one of the reasons I went with the negative zone. Was we seem to be living in very divisive, negative times. And, uh, you know, comics give us that positivity and art gives us that positivity. So mm -hmm. hopefully people will get a, you know, a feel good from this. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys the toughest question, right? Uh, favorite character to draw slash paint. <laughs> Is that the toughest question? That's the toughest question. <laughs> wow. wow. 
that's I'm, I'm it's not a, it's it's a, with that one. It's as soft as bounty. Yes. <laughs> Uh oh. Well, let me look. I guess it was difficult because he froze again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you giving Patrick. Patrick, right. he's, I think he's telling you to go first. Okay, sure. Um, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, you know, this book kind of wrote itself once I started, and I would have never picked Mister Fantastic to be the lead character because he's mm -hmm. one of the more boring characters. <laughs> not, not you know, other than a long neck or long arms, he's really not that much fun to draw. I think in doing the book, I enjoy drawing all of them. I would say the old Iron Man with the spiky helmet was my favorite character to draw. You know, I was just at the Baltimore Comic Con, and people who bought the book, I would ask who their favorite character was, and I would do a sketch of that character. And uh, I tell you, it, that was like one of the most fun days for me in a long time, just to be doodling uh, Marvel characters for the day. Uh, and I'm going to be at the New York Comic Con uh, next week, and I'll be doodling my favorite characters and your favorite characters in those books too. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally lost Alex. <laughs> I totally lost Alex for a second. Um, but we do have a viewer question. Uh, John, you think you can throw that up for us? And actually actively cannot see the viewer questions. Alex, I can see your old school influences in your art, e.g. Ramita, Trump, uh, Trump, Starlin, et cetera. Are there painters that have also influenced you, e.g. Larkin, Norum, Barr? We'll see Alex isn't here. <laughs> well, but actually, I, oh, okay. Oh, you're here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, I, I see myself on screen. I, I don't know. Okay, your your screen is blank. What from where I'm seeing it, but uh, oh, okay. Feel, I mean, if, if you if can't you answer, hear that me. Um, yeah, the answer to that is all of those they listed: um, hmm. Norum, Larkin, Barr. They are the three preeminent painters um, who were doing covers in the late '70s for. Marvel's magazine line for the Rampaging Hulk magazine, mm -hmm. which had an enormous influence on a uh, eight-year-old me. So mm -hmm. I uh, I loved that stuff and the way those guys interpreted these characters into lifelike renderings was shaping exactly what I wanted to do with my adult life. This was something mm -hmm. that I wanted to rise up to, and um, yeah, that was one of those guiding things. There's a whole lot of painters I could list that are coming from either American illustration, like your Rockwells and Andrew mm -hmm. Lucas's, but um, there's also just the comics based stuff, which these three names that were put out there are very preeminent for me, aside from the painters who uh, were painting storytelling in comics before I got in the business. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously a whole lot of influence from those men that did that, people like Bill Sienkiewicz and, um, mm -hmm. You know, Dave McKean. Uh, yeah, right. it's it's a long list. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, Patrick, what about you? What are what are your influences? Like, of course, you're known for the book Mutts, uh, <laughs> in addition to many other graphic novels. What are your influences? Well, you know, uh, I mean, as a kid, obviously, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee and Steve Dicko were important to me, but I was also a comic strip nut, and I think Peanuts is the reason I became a cartoonist, and uh, mm. Crazy Cat was a major influence. Uh, you know, I think I knew even at an early age, I wasn't as talented as Alex Ross and Jack Kirby to do anatomy right and to, to draw things realistic. So I, I you know, uh, naturally lean towards the more humorous, uh, sketchy cartoon. So I would say Herman and Schultz mm -hmm. were two major influences. Mm -hmm. And for this book, probably mostly Kirby. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Look, I was actually thinking, I was like, uh, Alex has been pulled into the negative zone, it looks like, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, excuse me. Oh, another was Alex, any chance for a Bernie Wrightson esque Swamp Thing versus Man Thing book? That's fan fiction, I guess, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you say Bernie Wrightson, that is one of my biggest childhood influences. Uh, and uh, there was a point uh, when I was a teenager that. I was directly trying to imitate his style from things like the Frankenstein book that he worked on. Um, mm. So uh, big, big influence in my young life. And in particular, when I first saw Swamp Thing, I thought there was something to its realism, even though his work was so stylized, I saw the shadow play in it and thought, I've got to get that into my work because mm. I wasn't getting that from all my other influences of artists who were drawing regular meat and potatoes comics. They didn't use shadow in the way Bernie did. Um, 
but I, I have an adoration for Bernie's version of Swamp Thing. I do not have an adoration for Marvel's Man Thing. To me, he's just a rehash <laughs> of the old 40s character, the Heap. And um, mm. I don't find him visually stimulating. Mm. But mm. Swamp Thing, yes. Swamp Thing is like a version of Karloff Frankenstein. And that's what I get out of it. And that's why I uh, connect so well to that and Frankenstein, uh, Bernie's Frankenstein. Gotcha. Understood. Uh, what is next for both of you before we uh, wrap up? Uh, anything you can tell us to that might be coming down the line that uh, you want people to keep an eye out for? Well, for me, uh, you know, actually, <laughs> I have a character in my comic strip much called Guard Dog. And he's a chained dog. And he's been chained for a long time. <laughs> and I've been promising my readers for a while that I would do a story about him. So I'm doing a seven week long story, sort of like, uh, you know, the old adventure strips like Cherry and the Pirates or uh, mm -hmm. Dick Tracy. So uh, I haven't done that in a long time. So it's, it's been a lot of fun to do a, a daily story that lasts for seven weeks. Gotcha. Could your story conclude with uh, yourself written in to come along and uh, literally unchain the dog? <laughs> That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, you are in charge. You can make that happen. Technically, you chained the dog. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Unchained him, too, so. <laughs> uh, what about you, Alex? Anything coming down the line that you can uh, even mention, or is mom's the word? Oh, I no, I would tell you anything you want to hear, honestly. I mean, most <laughs> of my work is coming out as regularly as Patrick's are, where, you know, I'm seen in plain sight just by all the covers I do for regular books with Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm planning my next Marvel arts book, presuming they don't shoot it down when I do propose it to them. So okay. I've just given myself kind of a year off from uh, stressing over it. But I've also been developing a lot of designs, the concept and everything. And so when it comes together, it will be as much as I can cram into one book as humanly possible. All right. That's hey, awesome. Let me ask you, Alex, you know, in doing this book, I really, my appreciation for Ditko and Kirby just you know, went out of the roof. And what I was amazed with those guys was the quality, but the quantity of work they did. Mm -hmm. they, they always gave 100% and how much work they do. But boy, I mean, I think I'm even more impressed with you. I can't, do you, are you like me? Do you never leave the studio? <laughs> I never take vacations. Um, I barely take the weekend off. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm basically what you see is what I am. Um, I don't exist for in anywhere else other than on the printed page. <laughs> you know, when I was, when I was in art school, the story was that Norman Rockwell only took off Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I, I work on Thanksgiving and Christmas, so. <laughs> the lack of a cartoonist. Make sure I take those off, so. Oh, Master Sif 40 saying, this is so cool. Thank you, Master Sif. Much appreciated. Uh, guys, thank you. Oh, it was great, to, oh, it was great getting some insight. Thank you, John Millington. Yeah. Hurry up and get cramming. <laughs> okay, the audience is unforgiving. They just want they just want the end result. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining me, guys. I appreciate you giving me your time. Uh, I want to remind people: Fantastic Four Full Circle and Alex's poster book is available everywhere right now. Superheroes Journey is in stores as well, uh, and you can pick that up as well from your local comic shop. Uh, head over to comicshoplocator.com uh to find a comic shop loot near you or if you already know where your comic shop is hit a previous roll pull box uh that is a direct to order service that uh basically allows you to order the book to your comic shop and go pick it up because of course we want to support the local local stores also watch out for the uh, marvel value stamps visual history hardcover featuring art by alex alex ross on the cover and yeah, thanks again for joining us again. Uh, see you tomorrow as we talk to Blake Northcott and Kevin Rotatelli about massive publishing. And as always, I will see all of you, every every last one of you, at the Spinner Rack. Have a good one. <laughs>